Good evening, everyone, from Manila, Philippines. Greetings, my dear brothers and sisters in the Lord in this uh, conference or webinar. I greet you on behalf of the Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches. Thank you for having me this evening. I hope and pray that uh, by the grace and the power of our loving, our good and faithful Heavenly Father, that you are all safe and well in the best of everything, and most especially that you are maintaining balance between spiritual and physical health during these challenging times. I also pray and hope that you are using all kinds of opportunities brought about by this crisis, by being closer to God, and deepening your relationships with him, your family, your church, and keeping yourself occupied in strengthening your mind, spirit, and bodies. I praise God for the national disciple-making movement, this new movement that is setting the hearts of people, that's the hearts of disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, here in the Philippines, in motion, and setting our hearts on fire. Thank you, NDM, for your vision to continue to train and coach pastors and church leaders in collaboration with inter in intentional disciple-making network and wave makers using Sun Life uh, courses and other materials as your main training curriculum. I greet all the Filipino church leaders in Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, and wherever you are, all the churches and partners under your network across the Philippines and your networks of disciples or potential disciples that are partnering to pursue the vision of finishing the Great Commission by following the models of Jesus Christ and working together towards effective disciple making in ministries and communities and local churches. My assignment this evening in this segment is to present the local challenge of disciple making, zeroing in on and focusing on the current need for disciple making in our country, the Philippines. There are many reasons affecting the status of church growth, church multiplication, and disciple making in the Philippines. And that would include the historical movements, the context of socio, economic, political, and cultural situations in the country. But we do not have the luxury of time to tackle all of this in few minutes. And so this evening, I just want to zero in on some key issues, some issues challenging disciple making and disciple movements in the Philippines, and then uh, relating it to its impact to the church and what can be done. What can we do together as uh, members of the body of Christ in the Philippines? There are issues affecting the vision of discipling the Filipino nation. Number one is the, the history, the issue of history, the issue of history. We say we are a Christian nation. We are followers of Christ. Every Filipino, about 90 to 92 percent of the Filipino population would say, we are followers of Christ. We are Christians. This is the claim of the majority of Filipinos. Being the only Christian or the biggest Christian nation in Asia. If you would remember, before the Spaniards came to the shores of the Philippine Islands or uh, during the pre-colonial, Spanish colonial uh, period. Filipinos are mainly animists. We have strong indigenous religious beliefs, mythologies, and 
we believe in Anito, the ancestor worships, nature spirits, and indigenous deity worship. And because of early trade between Filipinos and our neighboring Asian countries, early on in the Philippines, there's Buddhism, there's Hinduism, and it can be traced even in the islands of the Philippines. There have been archeological artifacts on Hindu and Buddhist gold statues dated around 900 centuries ago. Islam arrived in the Philippines in the 14th century after the arrival of Ferdinand Magellan uh, in 1521, Roman Catholicism became the dominant religion in the Philippines. And so Christianity and the teaching about Jesus Christ was introduced during this period when the Spanish came to the Philippines. Nonetheless, indigenous Filipinos continue to practice animism even today, including the traditions of the Anito survive in the form of folk Catholicism. And this is the majority of the Filipino masses. We would remember also uh, in our history, commissioned by the King of Spain, Ferdinand Magellan arrived first in Homonhon Island on March 17, 1521, and claimed the islands, this is middle part of the Philippines, in the name of the King of Spain. On Easter Sunday that year, Magellan landed in Limasawa Island and the first 800 converts, converts baptized to Christianity. It was recorded when the king and queen of Cebu embraced the Catholic faith. And so within 25 years of the first converts in Cebu, about 250,000 Filipinos converted to Christianity. But in spite of the Roman Catholic strong claim and teachings about Christ and how effective they were in Christianizing the pagan Filipinos throughout the colonial period, the mission Spain established would serve several objectives. And what are these? to convert Filipinos to Christianity, therefore introducing Jesus Christ. But the mission serve as agencies of the church and the state to spread the faith to the natives, but also to pacify them from expansion of the Spanish colonizing empire, which is the ultimate aim of the state. After the United States took control of the Philippines from Spain, the evangelicals and Protestant missionaries arrived in the Philippines starting 1898. The first group of missionaries were from the U.S. Army. And then within months, missionaries from denominations arrived from the, arrived from the United States. The Roman Catholic Church was disestablished as the state religion in our country, giving more freedom for evangelicals and Protestants to send more missionary units. In 1901, the Evangelical Union was established for the coordination of ministries among the missionaries and to lay the groundwork for Filipino religious movements. The first Protestant service during this era was on Sunday, August 28, 1898. Chaplain George Stahl, a member of the Methodist Episcopal Church, came with the occupying, the colonizing forces. Also, this primary duty was to minister, his primary duty was to minister to the soldiers. He recorded in his diary that the first service conducted by him was held in an old Spanish dungeon facing Manila Bay. And it was 
attended not only by his own men, but by some Filipinos as well, and listened to his comment on this service that the power of God will use this day to make a good Catholic better. Any weak American stronger, any backslider ashamed, and the gloomy old dun dungeon, the beginning of a wonderful things in this island. Is my prayer. This serve, brothers and sisters, as the backdrop and the background of the increase and multiplication of evangelical work, and if I may say, discipling the Filipinos, evangelizing and discipling the Filipinos with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the background of Christianity in the Philippines. When Filipinos say we are Christians, we are followers of Christ, or we are the only Christian nation in Asia, it is because we woke up one day in a colonized country and Christianity was used for colonization purposes. There is resentment. There is corruption. There is advantage. If you belong to powerful elite religion, you belong to a Christian tradition. Now I believe, brothers and sisters, there is a need for Filipinos to really understand the gospel and what it means to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The second issue that is a challenge to us here in the Philippines is the issue of denominational expansion focused on starting denominational, denominational presence through church planting, aggressive church planting. When the American colonizers defeated Spain, and came to the shores of the Philippines. The missionaries came with them and declared the Philippines as free country in terms of choosing their own religion. The Americans after that, after that led in the committee agreement to divide the Philippine archipelago into provinces and regions by which denominations would focus their evangelistic efforts and their church planting movements. And so from 1898 to 1975, 5,000 Protestant slash evangelical churches were started in the country. Praise God. There was a rapid multiplication of churches from there on, from 1975 to year 2000. You would remember Dawn 2000 movement, disciple a whole nation, reaching the whole barangay, a church in every village in the Philippines. As a result of that, more than 51,000 new churches were planted in the country. That's a great thing. 51,000 new churches from 1975 to year 2000. But you see what happened then was this. Many believers and leaders were catapulted to church leadership without careful discipleship processes without ministerial training, and without pastoral training. That surely resulted to rapid growth of a number of members and churches in the country because of aggressive church planting. In 2015, our count for the total number of evangelical uh, Protestant, born-again, and independent evangelical churches in the Philippines was 66,000. That very same year in 2015, 
the church leaders of the Philippines came again. And we envisioned of doubling the number of churches from 66,000 to 120,000 churches by year 2020. But you know what happened in 2020, early on? COVID-19 came in the picture early in 2020. But because of that, in spite of the pains, the sufferings and difficulties, death, separation, sicknesses that uh, the pandemic crisis brought, God opened many new doors for evangelism, for discipleship, as thousands of homes became places of worship in place of the uh, religious gatherings, in place of mass gatherings and worship services in uh, church buildings and facilities, thousands of homes became places of worship, places of prayer, evangelism, discipleship, and launching pad for missions. Churches also have transitioned to many out out online platforms such as what we are doing today. Lots of uh, online worship services, training, uh, disciple making, uh, webinars, conferences, and events. The point is, when there's rapid multiplication of churches, there should be equal amount of effort to nurture new believers to the faith, training them and mobilizing them for evangelism, discipleship, and missions. While there is an aggressive and, uh, emphasis and focus on church planting, I really believe that an equal amount of effort to disciple new believers to the faith is vital in the health of churches. Number three uh, challenge that we face in the Philippines as we disciple this nation. Most churches do not have church discipleship growth program. And this is true to churches who belong to the mainline denominations, churches who have existed in the past, and even new churches. Because of the emphasis on church growth and quantitative numbers of barangays and churches, the health of churches, the health of pastors, the training of leaders, and intentional discipleship were not at par to the gains of church growth. You see, Sunday worship services, of course, there's Sunday school before or after the Sunday worship services. Sunday school are mainly teachings and doctrines. And then there's the midweek, uh, Wednesday prayer meetings, plus the sectoral fellowships for youth, women, men. And these were the main events of the church. So the church has become methodical and programmatic uh, uh, based on activities and events and programs. But praise God, in the last 20 years in the country, intentional disciple-making processes and new programs were introduced. And many churches and church leaders started to Reevaluate their programs, their activities and events, and even the vision and mission of churches and denominations towards disciple making. And so we welcome more efforts. We welcome more ministries and programs that would really encourage, train, and multiply leaders towards this vision. The issue number four is this. 
the issue of church unity. Unity of the church is a major and important factor also wherein we see the vitality of unity of the body of Christ for strategic planning, for saturation of the country, and the discipleship of the Philippines. Recent history would remind us in the Philippines of the bitter impacts of division in the church because of political division. And many different issues affecting church multiplication and church growth. Leaders have been divided uh, for many years, and that affected the effort of the church to disciple the country. As the Lord Jesus Christ prayed that his disciples may be one with great emphasis when he said the world will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another the world will know we are Christians the world will believe of our claim biblical claim that we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ if our testimony if our expression and demonstration of loving one another is very true as we envision a truly discipled Filipino nation. And so this I see, I I know there are so many other uh, reasons and challenges, but uh, historically uh, the issue of uh, denominational expansion uh, focused on uh, Uh, church planting, and then uh, the lack of uh, church discipleship growth uh, program. Uh, That is a great uh, need in the church. That is an issue. And the issue of church unity as a factor where we see unity of the body of Christ is needed. We need to work together. We need to coordinate in order for us to really the dis- disciple the whole country for the Lord Jesus Christ. Briefly, I would like to cite the impact and the needs and what can be done in the, with these challenges presented. The impact of rapid uh, church multiplication, as I have uh, earlier mentioned, is this. Many church leaders were not disciples. They were are, are not trained even for ministry, but they were uh, sent and commissioned and appointed to be pastors and leaders of churches. As a result of that, it produced many unhealthy churches unhealthy pastors, unhealthy church leaders, uh, members and uh, believers that were not properly nurtured and discipled resulted to unhealthy churches. So we need to train leaders. We need to uh, provide opportunities for rapid multiplication of disciple-making trainers and disciple-makers in every denomination, in every group, in every movement, and in every local church in our country. And I really believe this. Every Bible school in the Philippines, every seminary, every Bible institute must consider intentional disciple-making education and courses to be included in their curricula. All students of the Bible must have on-the-job training uh, program in seminaries, in Bible schools, in institutes, in churches. 
where they will introduce discipleship processes in churches and groups. Another impact of uh, rapid multiplication of churches and uh, the many situations that I have mentioned, churches are not reproducing disciples and churches. They are just going through the motion of worship service, many events and more, many programs and activities in the church, but are not producing uh, authentic and real disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ that are devoted to God, devoted to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to strengthen efforts in the Philippines of multiplying trainers of disciple-making groups. And we must introduce to all churches the benefits of intentionally discipling believers for church health and multiplication. Of course, uh, the, uh, uh, the quality of uh, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ if people, if believers are uh, disciple, and that is the, the qualitative uh, factors uh, in church health, quantity, numbers will come as automatic result. There will be church health and there will be reproduction and church multiplication. On the impact of, on the issue of unity, I believe that continued dialogue between leaders for consultation, sharing of resources, sharing of knowledge, and concrete plans for uh, multiplying leaders for disciple making. And so NDM in your training sessions, in your fellowship groups, in your meetings and uh, online events and in the future face-to-face um, uh, -face events. Continued dialogue between leaders for consultation and sharing of resources and knowledge would really help uh, in the area of uniting the whole church to uh, have a common vision for the country. The Philippine Council of Evangelical Churches is, is we is thankful. And we are here to support and serve the national disciple making movements and all movements that would help strengthen the efforts of the churches to really disciple believers and disciple the whole nation for the fulfillment of our common vision the discipleship of the Philippines. PCEC launched a 10-year campaign which started in 2020. It's called the Decade of Disciple Making. This is a 10-year campaign from 2020 to 2030. We see the church being set in motion because of this 10-year campaign. We want to set the hearts of every believers to be on fire for every believer to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ and every believer to have an opportunity to be discipled, to be nurtured and to be equipped as disciple makers and be part of a healthy, growing and reproducing church. In turn, we envision every church in the Philippines starting new churches until the last person, until the last people group, until the last tribe, and every barangay is reached by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. NDM, we are grateful for your partnership in the discipleship of the Philippines. I look forward to a greater collaboration in the coming days with the National Disciple Making Movement.
Thank you so much. And God bless you all.